Well, I want to talk about a time when God really saved me. Um, and kind of through that, saved someone else. And um, those of you who knew me from the start will know that my dad was a missionary in, in West Africa. And when I was a teenager, I started going out there and I got malaria. Well, let me tell you a little bit about malaria. Malaria is carried by uh, mosquitoes and uh, a typical way to avoid it is to take prophylactics as tablets, quinine based tablets as it used to be. Uh, and that sort of reduces your chance of getting it if you're bitten by a mosquito. And the mosquito puts, uh, inserts things into you that um, end up as parasites in your liver. And that means that what happens is that you die, if in the worst possible case, by overheating. You actually, your whole body sort of, your body temperature goes up, you have a stroke, and then you, you die. That's how you die from malaria. So the way to treat it in those days was by megadose of quinine or something quinine based and along with a anti-sickness drug that enabled your, your body to, to keep that quinine. That was the way to deal with malaria in those days. It's still pretty similar. Megadose with quinine and then an anti-sickness drug to uh, enable your body to keep the quinine within you. So there I was, I got malaria and I was very sick with it. I ended up in the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in London in the UK and they found that I'm an unusual guy. My organism totally is resistant to quinine and I had uh, drips on both, uh, both hands. I had a drip of quinine coming in, high dose quinine all the time on one and on the other hand I had, uh, I had the anti-sickness drug coming in to keep the thing in my system, keep the quinine in my system. Well, the uh, anti-sickness drugs didn't work on me. My organism also reacted violently against them, and I very nearly had a stroke. Um, by God's grace, uh, I didn't. By the way, eventually, uh, I was able to get my liver cleansed. This was some years later, uh, and I now don't have any malaria parasites. But in the years until that could be done, I did have the parasites in my, in my liver. They, they told me, by the time I got over it in the hospital that uh, you better not go back to any malarial area because your organism's got a very strange intolerance of quinine and a strange intolerance to the, uh, I think it was Maxillon it was called, um, and other anti-sickness drugs that are typically used in conjunction with quinine megadosing. So there's not much we can do for you. Well, I still have the parasites in my liver. As I say now, finally, they're out. I still have scarring in my liver as a result of it, but um, I'm now malaria parasite free. But back then, I still had those parasites in my liver, and I, well, I don't know if it was faith or the bravado of youth, but I, I went back to Africa. As I've often said, human motivation is never pure. You think that, oh, I'm doing this because I'm so full of faith or spirituality. Well, yes and no. And you've got to remember that in looking at yourself and also human behaviour generally. People who seem to be pretty awful may actually have some, some element of goodness in them as well, in their motivations, what they do, etc. Anyway, so there I was. I went back to Africa and uh, I was in Malawi, which in those days was one of the poorest countries in Africa. And I was way up off the, uh, off the beaten track in a rental car and I had driven right off the tarmac road on a, a dirt road, very, very, very far hours driving up to a remote spot near the Malawi Tanzania border, real David Livingstone country actually. Who, who's David Livingstone? Well, he was a great missionary. Oh yeah, he went to me in the car. That's right, the, the one we, um, yeah, that, that's right, the, the one we listened about. Yeah, so David Livingstone, that was the sort of place he was, up there, border of Malawi and uh, Tanzania. Anyway, so I was up there and I baptised a guy whose name was Duncan, weirdly enough. I only baptised two people called Duncan. One of them was in Scotland and the other one was this, uh, this brother in Malawi. Anyway, I started to come over feeling bad. Now, I used to have my bad turns because of the parasites in my liver, the malaria parasites, so I knew what it was like to have a bad turn with malaria, going to the 
high temperature, and they were just using paracetamol, aspirin to try to bring your temperature down. There was no point treating me with quinine. Uh, I was totally resistant to it, uh, and the organism just threw, threw it out, reacted very strangely to megadoses of quinine. So I knew that all I could do was to literally sweat it out of my system. Well, I was used to having these bad, bad turns, and I, I would just find a, a lodging house or somewhere and rest up for a couple of days till I'd sweated it out of my system. That's all I could do, and try and drink as much as you can because you just overheat. Um, well, I started to have a very bad turn, and I was driving. And I was drinking, drinking, drinking until I, I'd run out of water. There was nothing around. There was no people around there. There was no village. There was nothing. I was driving, 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 and I was getting delirious. And I knew I was going to pass out. This is the worst place to pass out, that in the middle of nowhere, I was not going to get attention. The ambient temperature was high, and this is Central Africa. Uh, temperature was high. Uh, I thought, well, this is going to be it, I guess. And I was driving, driving. I thought, I've got to stop because I, I'm going to pass out. I knew I was going to pass out. Well, I just didn't see anybody. And I thought, well, what I'll do is to just leave the car right in the middle of this so-called road, this dirt road. Um, and I will just lay here in the car, leave the keys in the ignition. I had my hospital documentation from the Hospital of Tropical Diseases in London. I always had it in my, in my pocket uh, next to my passport. I, I left that um, on the, uh, I thought I'll leave that in the passenger seat. Uh, my passport is in my pocket. I just hope somebody is going to stop. If anyone comes in a vehicle, they're going to have to stop because I'm going to leave the car right in the middle of this road. They're going to have to stop. And I just hope that someone turns a key in the ignition and drives it or takes me somewhere to a hospital and at least does something. But I thought, well, they're not going to do much for me. Uh, so I was praying, praying to God, help me, help me. And... Uh, I thought, well, I better not leave the vehicle just on a turn on the road in case someone does come flying around the corner and smashes into me. If I'm, if my number's up, I don't want to take someone else out. Uh, I thought I'll leave it on a straight, so at least someone's going to see me, hopefully, and break and, and stop. Well, I come around the corner. Uh, here's a straight, and I was—I tell you—I was at the end. I, I was really—I knew I was going to pass out. I'd had these bad turns before, and I knew I was going to. This was it, the usual drill, I was going to lose consciousness. And I saw two white people. I hadn't seen anybody on this road for a long, long time. And I hadn't seen any white people for a couple of weeks. And I, I saw these, there were two young white people. I got closer to them and they had backpacks, two young white people. Well, I stopped, and, and they, they, well, I said I stopped, I had to. I mean, they, they got out in the middle of the road, and they were flagging me down. I, I would have had to stop, because they were going to force me to stop. Well, I stopped, and they were telling me, oh, oh, yeah, we've been, we got a, a ride here by a, a truck that then went up, a, 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 like a, a uh, like four-wheel drive, uh, what they call truck, but four-wheel drive sort of um, pickup wagon that uh, went down that track there and the guy left us here and we've been here for hours and no one's come, there's no people around here, there's no cars around here. Please, we, the woman said, um, she said, well, I don't even believe in God, but uh, I actually started praying to God that God was going to save us because we, we're pretty well out of water. We've just got this little bit of water left and, and we, it's hot and, well, you are saviour. I said, look, I'm about to pass out. Uh, all I could say was, I just managed to explain to them what I needed, that can you please give me your water, your bit of water you got left, and uh, drive this car to a hospital or to at least to buy water, and and uh, I told them my problem, I said, here's the thing, my medical documentation, don't let them give me quinine. Well, Somehow or other, I got into the passenger seat. The guy got in the car, in the driver's seat, and they, the, his girlfriend got in the back, and they put the seat back, and she was like holding uh, something on my forehead. I said, it's so important to keep my temperature down. Well, he drove, he started driving, and I passed out. 
And I came round in a, they were trying to get me out of the car into a hospital. And it was a, a, a pretty simple sort of place. And I kept saying, no quinine, no quinine. Oh yes, sir, we're gonna give you quinine. I said, no quinine, you read my documentation. No quinine. Well, they said, well, that's all we can do for you. Yeah, I said, I understand. Uh, so they said, well, what do you want to do? Why do you come to the hospital? Why do your friends bring you to the hospital then if we can't give you quinine and all that? That's, that's what we do. We megadose you on quinine. I said, I understand all about <laughs> megadose you on quinine. Read the documentation. You can do that to me. Like, I really will have a stroke. I'll get really out of order with this. Like happened before. So I was in one of the best hospitals in the world, London's Hospital of uh, Tropical Diseases, and blah, blah. I mean, I, I was pretty weak, but I was with it. And uh, they said, what, what can we do? And these, this couple said, well, what can we do for you? And I said, we can't leave you like this. And I said, no. I said, look, take me to a hotel. Um, and we were getting, we were, this was actually on the outskirts of the Longwe, which is the capital. I said, uh, it was a pretty long drive. I was out for hours. They said that they gave me water, but I, I couldn't remember it. I, I was out. Um, I said, look, we're in the middle, we're just coming into the Longwe. I said, uh, yeah, north of the Longwe, there's uh, uh, the Le Longwe Hotel on the right hand side. Because so you get past the airport and then there's the, uh, the hotel there, down there. There'd be signs up for it. I said, look, stay there, put me in there. And I said, I'll, I'll pay for your room and uh, I just if you could look after me, I'd be really appreciate, appreciative. Oh, they said, yeah, they were Australian. I said, uh, you from Australia, right? Yeah, I said, we're from Australia. Well, I'd never been to Australia at that time. And I have. Um, right now, that's right. And I have too. And you have, and you've got an Australian passport. So anyway, they were wonderful to me. And of course, uh, as I was getting better, getting more strength, I was trying to trying to preach to them. I said, you know, I was at the end. If you hadn't have been there, I said, God sent you. I was praying to God. I was getting my, my conscience a bit in order before God because I thought I was going to die. I said, if you hadn't have uh, been there, I said, I was just going to leave the car in the middle of the road and hope someone was going to stop. And they said, well, that's what we were thinking, that we, we thought we, we've got to get out of here because we're just on our own here. And there's, there's lions up there. There's certainly big cats up there. There's, well, they were there. They were big cats to spend the night in the bush up there would not be a great idea, uh, especially without water. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, so they said, well, we, we also thought that we are, we're going to have to um, flag down, or we're going to have to physically stop any vehicle that comes down this road, down that road, and beg them and force them almost to, to take us. And I said, well, that's what I was thinking, that if I see anybody, I'm going to have to force them to get in this car and drive it. And I said, yeah, that's from God. And they said, well, we don't particularly believe in God and all that. Um, and they were typical young, early 20s Australians. They weren't married. They were just like living together. They were hanging out together. And uh, when I tried to preach to them, as I got stronger, I said, well, thank you very, very much. Um, what can I do for you? Oh, no, nothing, mate, you know. It was a great experience. It was really interesting. Well, I guess it was better than just sitting around, you know, as a backpacker. Um, I guess it was interesting for them. And I really wanted to give them something about, about the gospel. And I didn't want to give them my Bible. And, I mean, they kept saying, yeah, no, we're not really interested, thanks. We're not in all that stuff. And uh, I wanted to give them something, and I had literature, but it was in Chichewa, that's the Malawian language. I didn't speak Chichewa, neither did they. But what I did have, uh, and this shows how long ago this was, I had with me the draft version of Bible Basics, which I was writing. I wrote a lot of that on the road in Africa. And I had a hard cover exercise book. And I used to write, it was all in handwriting, it was before the days of laptops, computers and all that, uh, personal computers. I would write um, with, and leave a line in between each line so I could correct and cross things out and rewrite things. And I, I'd written out the uh, well, contents and all that and I more or less actually the final version pretty well kept to most of that. 
And I'd written chapter one, which was God. <clears throat> and I hadn't written chapter two, which is about the Spirit of God, but I'd written chapter three, the promises of God. And I'd written a bit of chapter four, God and death, and a bit of chapter five, which is the kingdom of God. And it was all in handwriting. And, well, my handwriting's not, no, I'm not a doctor, so I, it's legible, but, um, you know, not great. A lot of crossings out, stuff like that. And I had it, it was thick, hard, hard, hard back bound uh, book that I, I was using, like a ledger, what used to be called a ledger. That sort of solid, thick thing. I still actually got it somewhere in my dad's garage in, uh, in Croydon, as I remember. Well, I said to them, look, just wait a minute before we say goodbye. I'd like to get you something. So I took my book, which was my most, pretty well one of my most valuable possessions. I took it with me and I, uh, yeah, I'd spent hours and days writing, writing up the doctrines of the gospel. And uh, I, I had seen a photocopy shop, Photostat, as it was called in those days, Photostat. And I took it to the to the shop, and they were charging however many tambala it was per copy, and it was a slow old thing, a sort of thing crept across the uh, across the uh, the text, and then crept back again, and slowly your one page came out. It took me ages to get this handwritten book of mine copied, not all of it, a bit of it, and the woman kind of gave up with me after probably nearly an hour, and because it was taking a few, a couple of minutes to do just a page, and sort of said, well, you operate it, I operated it, and then she sort of said, oh, I think it's overheating, I think, well, okay, so I took what I could, and then I, I got a hole punch, punched the, the holes, and asked her for some string, and bound it together, I'm not very good at things like that, but I, I, I knocked it together, and I went back to this couple, and I, I said, look, I've got you a little present. It's, it's not what you want, but it, probably. But I would like to give it to you, if you don't mind uh, accepting it from me. And I said, you know, I'm preaching the gospel. This is how I understand the gospel. And I urge you with all my heart to see that God's hand was in all this. You on that road in the middle of nowhere, that dirt track where this, for some weird reason a guy had given you a ride and, and said, look, I've got to go up, uh, up down this track. Um, you know, you'll have to wait here. They said, well, the guy told us that when we, he first picked us up, that it was going to be very difficult to get an onward uh, pickup further, but we thought we'd been sitting around doing nothing where we were, so we thought, yeah, just risk that. We didn't realise it's going to be in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, I wrote my name, Duncan Easter, and my address, this was before email and all that, and I, I gave it to them. And I prayed with them, and they sort of, well, they weren't believers. And I said, oh, thanks for the experience, mate. You know, it was all good. Well, I thought about that, and I've thanked God for it over the years, because inadvertently they kind of saved my life. They were sort of angels, as it were. You know, people used by angels, let's put it that way. Well, fast forward 20, nearly 25 years. Get a message on Facebook. Uh, are you the Duncan Heaster who we met in uh, Malawi? We don't see any other Duncan Heaster on Facebook. And that's, that's a fact. Uh, and I, I, I said, yeah, well, that, that'd be me. And who are you? And they told me their story. They said, uh, you know, we chatted and all that, as you do on Facebook. And I said, well, you remember that load of stuff, handwritten stuff you gave us? Yeah, I said, I do remember it. Actually, the memory of it, of doing that, had got a bit dim. Um, but when they reminded me, I, I did remember it. And now I recall it very clearly when they reminded me. They said, well, you know, we were just backpacking, as you know, around Malawi and, and Central Africa. And we spent a lot of time with nothing on our hands to do found a lodging house somewhere and got stuck there for two or three days, no transport on, trying to cross various rivers, nothing to do. And so we, uh, we both read your, your book, your handwritten book. And um, we read it and reread it until the, it was photostat, not photocopy, until you know, the, uh, 
that sort of dusty kind of so-called ink that was used, uh, sort of worn off. You know, they said, we, uh, we decided that we should become Christian. And we ended up in Johannesburg in South Africa. And we went to a church and said, we want to become Christian. And they said, well, yeah, that's okay. And we sort of became Christian. And then they said, we, we flew back to Australia and we decided we ought to get married and not just hang out together. And they said, they said we got married <clears throat> and we've had two kids. We joined a church. We've been baptized and our two children uh, were baptized as teenagers and we're very happy in this church. Well, I said, um, I try to engage them about, you know, God's not a trinity and you know there's a lot of fake doctrine out there, there's a lot of fake people in life, there's a lot of fake stuff out there in the churches. Um, but they didn't seem to want to bite on that. I said, yeah, give me your address, I'll send you a hard copy of my, my book, Bible Basics, which I did. Try to talk to them about the devil, that the devil is, you know, not a fallen angel and all that. And the kingdom of God will be on the earth, we don't go to heaven when we die, we don't have an immortal soul. I tried to engage on all those issues, but uh, they weren't interested. They said, oh, do come and see us. Well, I live way out in country Victoria, which is uh, a long way from where I go when I'm in Australia, I go to see Cindy's mum and dad in, uh, in Sydney. If I was down there, I might drop in and see them, but I, I'm, not, I'm not generally wandering around country, uh, rural Victoria. Um, so it was, I don't know what to make of it, because you can't say it was random. You can't say that was random. And did they come to Christ? Well, I think so. Um, because I, I think that's too fluky. I, I don't think that's random. I don't think that's like chance. God had a number on those people, just like he's got a number on you, he's had a number on me. He has a number on me. He's got a number on you, Dad. And that's too fluky. It can't be. It, can't, it just can't be chance. The hand of God was in that, most definitely. And I can only say that uh, when we're weak, then we are strong. And there's a higher hand in life. It's not of him that wills, or of him that runs, but of God who shows mercy.